Dr. Ching Cho Po published a number of uh, uh, articles in uh, many prominent Arab newspapers, including Al Ahram and Al Tahad and others, uh, and uh, tackled a number of uh, internal and external foreign relations of China and other uh, countries in their relationship with China. His writings and uh, his publications have been warmly welcomed globally. Once again, we welcome Dr. Choi Chinko to tell us more about the role of Arabic uh, language and literature in cross-cultural understanding. Welcome, Dr. Uh, uh, Choi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hassan al -Mazuki. I would like to thank you, and I would like to thank uh, all uh, the uh, all those who follow and uh, view this uh, uh, lecture and this webinar. Uh, whether Arab viewers or Chinese viewers or viewers from all over the globe. But this is a wonderful opportunity, and uh, I'm really uh, proud that you have uh, invited me to shed light on this topic and to exchange uh, our uh, uh, knowledge with uh, our brothers and sisters from all over the world. And moreover, I would like to thank uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Zhang Chang, from, uh, a professor from Sharjah University. I heard that today there will be simultaneous interpretation into English. That is why I will try to uh, speak slowly to assist the interpreter to interpret and translate my research and my lecture to the best possible uh, level. As Chaudhry pointed out, uh, I will speak for around 40 minutes uh, and I will uh, leave around 20 minutes uh, for the viewers uh, to uh, pose the questions that they have. I will uh, try to be committed to the time that was allocated to me as much as possible. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you. Most welcome. So on this occasion, I will be talking about four key topics. After discussing those uh, topics with my friend Sauji this morning, first I will talk about my own personal experience in spreading the Arabic language and uh, the study of Arabic liter literature in China. I don't know. Can you see the screen properly? Yes, we see it, but uh, the it's not in the proper size. Uh, it's uh, not in the proper size. Yes, okay, that's true. I don't know. Maybe yes. Now it's clear. Now we see the full screen. Now we see it full. Now it's it's okay. Now it's not uh, full. N now better. Now let me try. Zoom. I know it's widely used. How is, does it look now? Yes. Now it, you see the full screen. Yes. Excellent. Yes, yes. Please uh, go ahead, uh, doctor. First, I will be talking about my own personal experience uh, for spreading the Arabic language and the Arabic literature in uh, China. I will speak briefly about that. Uh, then I will talk about uh, this. Another element uh, that is associated with the first one is the role of Sheikh Zaid Center. Where I'm the director of Sheikh Zaid Center. Uh, of Arabic and Islamic studies at the university uh, to increase uh, Chinese people's understanding of uh, them. I will also talk about the Arabic literature and uh, Arabic language in uh, China. Finally, I will be talking about my vision of Islam in China uh, because uh, uh, since I'm interested in the Arabic language and Arabic literature, from my perspective as a Chinese uh, researcher, uh, I want to give you my perspective on Islam in China. This is uh, uh, this is a picture or a series of pictures of the university where I work today. I believe it's a beautiful university. I would like to uh, introduce to you the university I work at through this uh, through those uh, images, and I hope that one day I will be able to welcome Mr. Hassan al Mazuki and uh, our other uh, colleagues from all over the world to our university. You are most welcome to come to visit our university. The University of Foreign Studies in Beijing. My personal experience is modest in terms of spreading Arabic literature and the Arabic language in China. I have issued a number of books. 
about uh, spreading the study of the Arabic language. For example, uh, the new uh, contributions to the Arabic language and lessons in translation between Arabic and uh, Chinese and uh, some selected uh, works of art or literary works from uh, Arabic literature and selected works from uh, modern Arabic literature. These are my translations. All of these books uh, were uh, written uh, by Adonis, uh, which I translated into Chinese. So far, six books have been published and this last book will be issued uh, soon. It has not been issued to the market yet. Uh, Adonis is uh, a famous uh, Arab Syrian uh, poet. And uh, here are some translations of the 1001 Nights, uh, some selected uh, poems by Mahmoud Dawish, and uh, the novel by Najib Mahfouz, uh, and other books. Uh, I will show you later some of them. But uh, speaking of uh, my experience in translation from uh, Arabic uh, language into Chinese, uh, there's uh, an article that was published in Al Haya newspaper recently in which I talked about my experience in translating uh, Juban's uh, literary works. After joining the university, I started studying the Arabic language and I started reading some short Arabic stories. Yet I felt, I have always felt that there is a distance between me and those literary works. Is the cause of this distance due to the prevalent cultural atmosphere in those literary Arabic works or personal or the feelings of the characters portrayed in them or the unfamiliar uh, literary approaches and mechanisms used in them. I don't know, but I finally managed to cross the distance and overcome this gap in the third year of my study at the university. As I started reading the Chinese translation of the Broken Wings story by Juban Khalil Juban, it is the first time that I get to understand and get a glimpse of the beauty of Arabic literature. So I bought the Arabic uh, copy uh, from my professor and I started, I spent uh, several days and nights uh, copying the Arabic script of uh, the story and translating it into Chinese to the best uh, possible level. This, this is something that I did 40 years ago as I moved from one house to another, yet I still have with me this notebook, which uh, has turned yellow. This is the notebook that you see on the screen here. This is the cover, which I put on it. And this is, this is my handwriting. It's still uh, not yet uh, mature. I was 17 years old back then. I still keep this notebook with me, despite uh, that it's, its pages turned yellow, because it is a very uh, passionate souvenir for me uh, that reflects my compassion towards Arabic literature. I would like to read out another segment. Uh, I uh, worked as a teacher at the university uh, in the early 1990s of the 20th century. I was surprised that uh, many of Juban, Khalid Juban's uh, works were not uh, uh, translated or had not been translated into Chinese yet, including his English uh, uh, works, including uh, Abrius and Sir and other works. So I uh, began to pay special attention to translating his works and reading them thoroughly. I remember that this was this took place at the beginning of a very cold winter, and the workers uh, made some artifices into my wall to install a radiator or the a, a, a radiator to warm my uh, house, but they it took them one week to uh, block those uh, uh, offices. I used to sit uh, under the table. Uh, I used to sit under the light and uh, wearing uh, a cotton uh, uh, cover and uh, uh, wearing a cotton coat. I used to uh, sit right below the bulb to read and to write and translate without feeling uh, 
any uh, sense of loneliness. I was actually very happy. When I read the works of Juban, Khalil Juban's uh, uh, works, which I've translated into Chinese, I felt that uh, I felt the same cold air that was mixed with dust, which sipped into my house from the offices made into the wall. And I also felt the warmth that uh, those uh, works of Arabic literature used to give to my heart uh, as embodied in Jubaran Khalil Jubaran's works. These are Jubaran Khalil Jubaran's uh, works, which I translated into Chinese. I worked with another uh, professor in translating an entire group of Jubaran Khalil Jubaran's works in addition to his uh, the uh, love letters uh, to my Haskell and to my Ziada. Uh, that were written by Juban Khalil Juban. Now I move on to the role of uh, Sheikh Zayed Center uh, in increasing the level of awareness of Arabic and uh, uh, Arabic language and Arabic literature among the Chinese people. It was established by uh, a generous gift uh, and school, uh, uh, a generous uh, giving and gift made by the late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan. Uh, he gave us uh, this gift or this donation. He made it in the year 1990 during his first visit to China. And this center was established in the year 1994. It was built in the year 1994. And up that, uh, from that time up till now, first, around 1,200 graduates uh, who have PhD and uh, master's degrees and BA degrees graduated from that center. Moreover, writings and translations and researches about uh, the Arabic uh, languages and Arabic sciences uh, have been issued through the center. We welcomed many uh, heads of states uh, and uh, presidents and leaders from Arab countries and other countries. We welcomed them in the center. We, all, we also welcomed prominent Arab uh, figures, including the uh, the, the program or as part of the program of exchanging visits uh, with the uh, prominent Chinese uh, and Arab uh, uh, figures to China. We also uh, organized scientific seminars and artistic seminars and linguistic contests and uh, poetry contests and other activities related to the Arabic language and Arabic literature. We take a look quick, quickly at uh, some of the pictures which uh, showcase uh, the uh, achievements of the center of course uh, in those activities uh, a number of professors took part in those activities these are some of the books and some of the writings and translations these are the curricula for the, the arabic language uh, uh, it is noteworthy that most of uh, the uh, curricula of teaching the Arabic language in the Chinese universities, most of them were written by uh, the professors working at Sheikh Zayed Center. This is a sample of the books that have been published recently. You see here below. This is the history of the Arabic Islamic culture by Ahmed Amin in eight volumes. This was issued in eight volumes last year. This is a new translation of 1001 Nights by a professor in our university as well. These are some of the figures, the art figures, which visited our university and Sheikh Zayed Center over the past years, including the permanent uh, poet Adonis, the uh, novelist Gamal al Ghitani, an Iraqi poet uh, Saad Yusuf. And this is uh, Miss, Mrs., uh, the famous uh, uh, Egyptian writer Nawal Sadawi, and uh, other figures visited the center as well. This is in the uh, celebration of launching uh, poems by Mahmoud Dawish at the center. Here are also some of the activities that we conducted. Every year we celebrate the Arabic Language Day. Last year, we conducted the first celebration and the first festival, the first festival of Arabic language and Arabic literature. And this festival 
will be conducted once once again for the second year for the sec in a row here in upcoming December of this year. These are some of the activities, Chinese uh, activities uh, in the Chinese language and the Arabic language, uh, some academic uh, um, activities. I would like to introduce the uh, Arabic audience here that here every year in China, we have a contest in China for eloquence in Arabic, in the Arabic language. Uh, students give a speech in the Arabic language. Students from different Islamic universities, uh, and this is considered a highly important cultural festival in the uh, circles of learning the Arabic language in China. Here are some of the pictures uh, which show a number of pictures. This is uh, Mr. Faraz Sawah, the famous Syrian researcher who worked at our university for seven years. He, he left uh, because uh, he became very old. Now he retired and he went back to Syria. Here are the, some uh, of the exhibitions of uh, uh, Arabic calligraphy. This is the this is a famous uh, Emirati calligrapher called Muhammad Mindi. He visited us and he gave a lecture. Of course, uh, a number of uh, folklore activities. This is we have uh, the uh, library of Sheikh Zayed Center that was inaugurated three years ago. It was inaugurated in uh, the book fair in Abu Dhabi. The, it was uh, inaugurated uh, during the book fair in Abu Dhabi. This, the head of the university, or the president of the university, uh, of our Chinese university, visited the, the UAE last year, and he visited Sheikh Zayed University, and uh, he gifted a number of books that have been uh, issued from that library to Sheikh Zayed University. Yes. In brief, the center today, Sheikh Zayed Center, has become a very important center for preparing uh, Chinese researchers and students who, are, uh, who have been excellent in studying the Arabic language and studying the Arabic, the different branches of Arabic literature. And also, it projects a wonderful image of the Arabic and Islamic culture in China. In addition to boosting and underscoring the friendly relations between China and uh, the Arab countries in general, and the UAE in particular. Now I would like to move on briefly to the third uh, element or the third uh, uh, topic in my lecture today, which is the Arabic language and Arabic literature in China. The Arabic language first arrived uh, to China at a very, very early time. Uh, many Chinese researchers date the uh, entry of the Arabic language into China back to the time of uh, Tang Dynasty in the 7th century. Why? Because since that time, and with the arrival of Arab traders who used to flock to China through the Silk Road, some of them lived in China. Some of them married Chinese women. Some of them married Chinese women. That is why the Arabic language uh, with the arrival to China, the Arabic language arrived to China. At the beginning, of course, the Arabic language is being taught to uh, small segments of students uh, among uh, those Arab expatriate groups, or some of them also uh, uh, speak uh, uh, Persian, as, Persian as well. And then, uh, in addition to the Arabic language and studying the Islamic culture, some of them study these uh, topics in uh, private schools and Islamic schools. And in, in two dynasties, in Ming and Qing dynasties, in the 17th century, the uh, translation movement was initiated to translate Arabic literature into Chinese. The objective of this movement, of this activity, as I told you recently, the Arabic language first arrived to China in the uh, 7th century. Now, after 10 centuries elapsed, and after the Arabic uh, uh, or the Arab uh, expatriates merged into the Chinese uh, community and the local Chinese community, many of uh, Muslims in China, of course, uh, many, many Muslims uh, in China have Arabic, uh, have Arab or uh, uh, Persian origins, uh, but uh, they do not speak Arabic uh, flu uh, fluently. And uh, because they forgot the Arabic language, uh, 
the knowledge and the understanding of the Islamic religion became very limited. That is why some researchers and some Muslim scholars who are fluent in Arabic believe that it is necessary to uh, write or to maintain or to protect the Arabic heritage on the Islamic heritage in the Chinese language. That is why it has become necessary to translate the Islamic, uh, the Arabic uh, lit literature or the Arabic heritage uh, into Chinese for two reasons. First, to protect this heritage, this Arabic Islamic heritage, to protect it from uh, being lost because the following generations do not uh, speak Arabic. So they need to know that heritage in the Chinese language. Secondly, because Muslims in China are considered a minority. So how this minority can live in the massive Chinese culture? Given the fact that the Chinese emperor used to inquire about Islam, he used to ask uh, some Muslims and Muslim researchers about uh, the uh, concepts of Islam and the core of Islam. In addition to the emperor, the uh, well-educated Chinese uh, figures also wanted to know more about Islam. That is why the translation of the Islamic heritage into Chinese uh, meets those needs as well and uh, enables uh, cultured individual in China to learn more about uh, Islamic intellect and get to know Islam. Then the Arabic language began to be taught in Chinese universities. This is a relatively new movement with the establishment of uh, uh, China, uh, modern China in the year 1994, People's Republic of China. Uh, after, with the establishment of the People's Republic of China, uh, the Arabic language began to be taught in universities. Previously, it used to be taught in Islamic schools or private schools, but uh, with at that date, they began to be taught at uh, uh, Chinese universities as part of the Chinese curricula taught at uh, these universities after the establishment of the People's Republic of China, which is almost 70 years old now. So until the early or the beginning of the 21st century, we had seven or eight Chinese universities that teach the Arabic language. However, with the advent of the new century, now we are in the 21st century, this is 2020, this is the year 2020. After the elapse of 20 years into the advent of the Arabic language, after the advent of uh, the new century, the 21st century, now we see that China is witnessing a major spread of uh, studying Arabic language in Chinese universities. Now, the total number of uh, Chinese universities that teach the Arabic language has reached almost 60 universities, 60 universities, or even more, because every year we have one or two new universities that start teaching the Arabic language. So moving from seven or eight universities that teach the Arabic language at the beginning of this uh, century, or going all the way up to 60 universities that teach the Arabic language now. We can say that the, uh, the Arabic language has achieved a major leap in China in terms of its spread in China. I would like to talk about uh, translating the meanings of the Holy Quran into Chinese. Of course, at the beginning, I believe that the situation in China is similar to the situation in other uh, non Arab countries where Muslims, most Muslims in all over the world do not speak the Arabic language. So, to get to know the religion, we need to translate the meanings of the Holy Quran into their languages. But there was an opinion because some Muslims say that the Holy Quran cannot be translated. In, uh, because the uh, translation of the Holy Quran may change or result, uh, uh, change the meanings or result into misinterpreting its meanings. So even the researchers who were fluent in Arabic, they were very really hesitant in terms of translating the meanings of uh, the Holy Quran and uh, translating them into Chinese. However, 
uh, as time passed by, we have reached almost a consensus among Muslims and uh, Chinese uh, researchers that uh, there is a dire need for translating the meanings of the Holy Quran into the Chinese language to assist Muslims in China to understand Islam in the proper manner. That is why, up till now, we have we have had 14 translations of the meanings of the Holy Quran. All of them have been issued as uh, uh, independent books. The most famous translation of them is the translation conducted by Professor Muhammad Makin, uh, a famous Muslim researcher who was a professor who used to work as a professor at. at أن شرحت هذه النقاط أحب أن أشير إليكم صورتين هذه صورة للباحث المسلم اسمه ليو تزي هو الذي كما قلت لكم ساهم في نقل الفكر الإسلامي إلى اللغة الصينية ليس في ترجمة دقيقة ولكن كان أسلوبه يجمع بين ترجمة والتأليف هذا مقبرته في مدينة نانجين في وسط الصين بين أوساط الصينية هناك بين أوساط الإسلامية في الصين هناك احترام كبير لسيد ريوتز ويعتبر شخصية ثقافية دينية مهمة في تاريخ الإسلام في الصين أما هذا فهو الأستاذ محمد مكين أستاذ من جامعة بكين مكين أستاذ من جامعة بكين هو 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 مكين من رواة اللغة العربية من أهم رواة اللغة العربية في الصين الحديثة ننتقل إلى الأدب العربي في الصين أيضا مرورا سريعا حتى أوفر الوقت للنقطة الرابعة الأدب العربي في الصين بدأ دخول الأدب العربي في الصين في عام 1896 the Egyptian poet Al Busiri. لأن دخول الأدب العربي إلى الصين أيضا يرجع إلى أزم إلى زمن بعيد جدا. وفي بعض ذلك شهدت ترجمة الأدب العربي في الصين أربعة مراحل. مرحلة الأولى بداية من ترجمة قصيدة بوردة إلى ما قبل تأسيس الجمهورية الصينية الشعبية. وكتبت بعض الشيء أحب أن أقرأ لكم في 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 إيجاد. ضيفلي. يمكن اعتبار المرحلة التي بدأت. We can consider that the stage which was initiated by the translation of Al Burda poem until the establishment of the People's Republic of China in the year 1946 is considered the first stage of translating Arabic literature into Chinese. This stage did not witness extensive activities in terms of translating Arabic literary works into Chinese. The فقد قام بعض العلماء المسلمين في ترجمة عدة كتب تتعلق بالدين الإسلام والحضارة العربية الإسلامية عن اللغة العربية مباشرة أما ترجمة الأدبية فتمت على أيدي المترجمين عن لغات أخرى حيث ظهرت As we have seen a number of translations, partial translations 
of uh, the 1001 Nights, uh, which were translated from uh, uh, English and Japanese into Chinese, and the translation from Arabic into Chinese directly uh, of 1001 Nights uh, was first initiated by the Muslim uh, Arabic uh, uh, researcher uh, Nachinga. Nachinga, who uh, <coughs> بالإضافة إلى ألف ليلة وليلة كان للقراء سنيين احتكاكا في الأدب العربي الحديث أيضا منها مثلا بعض الأعمال لجبران خليل جبران وأعمال أخرى قليلة هذه هي المرحلة الأولى قبل تأسيس جمهورية سنة شعبية وتعتبر الفترة من تأسيس جمهورية سنة شعبية إلى ما قبل الثورة الثقافية المرحلة الثانية لترجمة الأعمال الأدبية. Stage of translating those literary works and during that period of time we had the fight against colonialism and the the independence the war of independence and the fight for independence. That is why China back then was really passionate about interacting with people in the same situation. So a number of national poems by Abdul Qasim ثم يأتي ما عرف في الثورة الثقافية التي دامت عشر سنوات ابتداء من عام 1966 والتي في الحقيقة ليست إلا كارثة بكل معنى الكلمة وكان مضمار ترجمة الأدبية العربية حين ذاك صورة مصغرة لما كانت تعانيه الصين من التهور الاجتماعي والاقتصادي والثقافي. إذ أن الصين at the cultural and economic level back then the activity of translation disappeared completely during that period of time. After the end of that period and after the start of the reform and development. Uh, era in China in the 1980s, the uh, translation of from the Arabic language started the third and golden era, which uh, started and continued until the mid of the 1990s. During that third stage, which is less than 20 years, around 150 works from Arabic literature, including novels, stories, and collections, and uh, or collections of poems and other literary works from Arabic were translated into Chinese, including. The war, uh, some works by Najib Mahfouz uh, and many other writers. Najib Mahfouz, up till now, more than 10 novels by Najib, by Najib Mahfouz were translated into Chinese up till now. Of course, uh, these are, this is the third stage after the end of uh, the Cultural Revolution in the, the middle of the 1995 or the 1990s. Then the uh, pace of uh, translation decelerated. We have the uh, WIPO uh, organization in, in the middle of the 1990s, uh, because in the past, uh, translating literary works uh, into other languages and into Chinese was something that we did not have to pay IP right, for IP rights uh, because China had not signed the uh, WIPO agreement uh, and had not uh, uh, joined the WIPO uh, then, uh, back then. But after uh, China uh, became a member of the WIPO in the 1990s, uh, translation of uh, other uh, works of art or uh, uh, literary uh, works became regulated by uh, certain laws as uh, publishing house had to obtain approval of uh, the author or the, the other publishing house before they can publish in China. So this means that uh, they have to take into account uh, financial uh, uh, considerations before selecting a work of art for uh, or a literary uh, work into Chinese. So in, in that stage, uh, the, we started the fourth stage, which is a quiet stage uh, in the new century and up till now. We had more than 150. They have. We have almost now 150 novels and uh, uh, a group of stories or a group of poems. All of them have been translated into Chinese from Arabic into Chinese. After the, this presentation about the most important achievements in the in Arabic literature in China, 
we can reach to the conclusion that the Arabic literature has proven itself in China through a number of generations of translators. And the movement of translation is still, of course, it still has some difficulties and issues. And part of those problems is that the uh, old Arabic uh, heritage was not translated into Chinese only a handful of such works were translated into Chinese. That's the first point. Secondly, as of poetry and theatrical works, only a handful of them were translated into Chinese. But Adonis uh, poems are considered a, uh, uh, an exception in this regard, uh, as the, there were other uh, poets, of course, that I've referred to, in addition to the fact that uh, the uh, translation focused on specific uh, uh, countries, but unfortunately, GCC uh, literature and uh, the uh, Moroccan literature have not uh, received the due attention. Thirdly, the level of translating from Arabic uh, trans, uh, from the Arabic literature into Chinese was not satisfactory in general, uh, and uh, the uh, limited quality of this translation limited the spread of uh, those literary works in China, as most of these translations. With, with the exception of 1001 Nights and Jubaran Khalil Jubaran and some other limited uh, novels by Adonis and Nagib Mahfouz, with, the, with those exceptions, the other books were not published except for a limited number of editions. And the readers of those books are limited only to researchers and those who are concerned with foreign literature. This is in brief. Uh, Arabic literature and Chinese uh, uh, language. Now I would like to uh, express my vision of Islam and China. Particularly, I'm not a Muslim, says the speaker. He says, I am a friend of Muslims, or even half a Muslim. For almost 40 years, when I started studying the Arabic language, I was raised, and on a daily basis, I uh, used to read the literary works and uh, Islamic works, whether they had to do with literature or the, the language itself. Uh, all of them, one way or another, had to do with Islam. That is why, on this occasion, I would like to share with you my vision of Islam. Yes. time runs out quickly. I would like to quote a few lines when talking about Islam in China. I would like to quote uh, from what was said what was said by the prominent uh, uh, figures who spread the Arabic language in China, uh, who were two Muslim scholars. One of them is my own professor, Professor Abdurrahman Abdur Najum, Professor Abdurrahman Najum, who wrote the following in uh, the uh, uh, briefcase of uh, a magazine that was issued uh, which compared the reality of Muslims in the West back then. Let us see what that uh, prominent Muslim researcher said in that magazine. He wrote, when it comes to intellect, Westerners seek to obtain openness and regeneration, but we have become captives of uh, uh, being conservatives uh, and uh, having a close uh, approach uh, in the west they adopt uh, new concepts but we uh, we have been swimming against the international tide in sciences they innovate and uh, are creative in the west uh, to cope uh, with the latest development of civilization but as for us uh, we have been content uh, with the sharia related uh, lessons and a religious uh, curriculum and we have neglected all modern trends it is true that fasting and conducting prayer are among the key pillars of uh, islam and uh, religious and very important religious duties for each and, uh, and every muslim but at the end of the day these are personal aspects of muslims lives and islam cannot be confined to those uh, uh, things only the second quote that i would uh, like to quote mr muhammad makin uh, the translator who translated the meanings of the Holy Quran into Chinese, he gave a lecture in Cairo in the year 1934 about the reality of Islam in China. 
in which he uh, referred to that the uh, backwardness of Muslims in China go back to uh, ignorance and internal strife and uh, poverty. Ignorance is at two levels, as he said. He said, first, ignorance of the Chinese uh, culture and modern sciences to the extent that some uh, uh, Muslim uh, leaders there do not speak uh, Chinese or write in Chinese in proper. Uh, in the proper manner and some others uh, claim that uh, getting to know the chinese culture and uh, the modern sciences will corrupt the religious knowledge secondly the ignorance of the principles of islam they had extensive uh, uh, disputes uh, about useless things such as for example should an example should the imam take off his shoes when he is conducting the funeral prayer or uh, is uh, growing one's beard uh, mandatory or not so and these uh, things go 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 to the level of uh, strife and even fighting so if the, if this is the reality of muslims less than one century ago what about the situation of muslims now no doubt that uh, a great deal of development has been achieved particularly after uh, uh, china uh, adopted the openness uh, policy more than 40 years ago in all fields almost in almost all fields still we have a number of challenges and in my own opinion there are two challenges that face islam in china today one of them is the islamophobia which has appeared and unfortunately have emerged in some segments in the uh, among the uh, most the chinese community uh, in recent years this is something that uh, uh, does not only hurt uh, chinese muslims feelings but it also hinders uh, achieving uh, a homogeneous life and harmony among the different ethnicities and poses a threat to stability and security in the Chinese community and therefore it has to be faced with very firmly and with all uh, mechanisms uh, culturally uh, and intellectually and uh, using security means as well. The uh, second challenge is the misunderstanding of the uh, values of Islam among some Muslims. This misunderstanding of the values of Islam is not uh, uh, something that goes in line with the great values and the greatness of Islam. And this is uh, uh, something that both scholars refer to. This, in addition to a number of uh, new negative phenomena that have emerged over the past 20 years. Uh, so this way we see that the image of Islam is, goes uh, away from uh, openness to close close-mindedness and from tolerance to uh, bigotry and from moderation to extremism and from the religion of ease to the religion of difficulty and from a civilization that achieved great achievements uh, uh, into all fields and walks of science to things that are confined to the beard and niqab and islamic schools and such things there is another phenomenon among muslims in china some of them uh, restrict their understanding of Islam to the religious aspects uh, and the fatwas issued by uh, scholars uh, and uh, the interpretation of exegesis uh, or the exegesis put forward by some scholars. They do not understand Islam as uh, a religion that encompasses the greatness of human civilization. They do not know about the great heritage that the great scholars and imams left for us throughout history those great scholars have had great achievements in building the uh, great civilization of islam some muslims in china have been influenced by some uh, extreme some fundamentalist uh, concepts who glorify the past in a blind manner and they are afraid of uh, intellect uh, of intellectual aspects and creativity and reason they, they consider it as misleading elements and uh, they only refer to religious texts and completely forget uh, understanding the core of uh, uh, Islam and uh, interpreting uh, the uh, holy texts of Islam according to the requirements of the, uh, the age they live in. Of course, uh, there is another story, but uh, uh, we don't have much time. This was uh, mentioned in a history book about the emperor and how uh, he asked Muslims about uh, their religion and how this Muslim researcher or Muslim scholar made a mistake. His understanding of uh, Islam and the uh, interpretation of Islam was really rigid in front of the emperor and uh, resulted in a misunderstanding because 
he said to the emperor that the message of Islam is to kill uh, non-Muslims. And this made the emperor angry. This is a story. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll have another opportunity or maybe during the Q&A session uh, to uh, refer to it. We know that in the Holy Quran, there are uh, some uh, verses that talk about killing the infidels, but they were revealed in historic uh, contexts and for specific political contexts. And this is not uh, strange as there is no religion in all the major religions that has similar texts. It is important. What, what matters the most is that Islam rejects uh, killing uh, uh, non-Muslims uh, uh, blindly or uh, uh, in a uh, massive and uh, uh, blind manner uh, quite the opposite actually exists as islam calls for dialogue and tolerance uh, so getting back to islamophobia islam has become in some people's minds uh, synonymous with closed-mindedness and backwardness uh, and associated with violence and terrorism therefore uh, it, it causes fear and worry and anxiety as for me Islam is completely different from the writings of uh, major scholars and uh, uh, men of letter and uh, uh, old and uh, prominent uh, scholars and uh, modern day and ancient uh, scholars. The understanding of Islam that they project is completely different from the current stereotype. Islam is a comprehensive uh, civilization system that has a glorious history and a massive heritage. And it is always keen on striking a balance between the spiritual and material aspects, individuals and community, reality and hopes, rights and obligations, this life and the afterlife, the message of Muslims, according to this concept and the value of people in this life is not about being restricted to ritual aspects only or to cling to the afterlife only it is uh, uh, not even uh, uh, restricted to worshiping Almighty Allah alone, but also to uh, spreading uh, uh, good in life uh, and doing good deeds in life and turning life uh, into something more like a heaven. So the real value of Muslims in this regard has to do not to cling the past, uh, cling to the past, but to uh, envision the future while uh, having their own values and moving courageously towards the future this way only what muslims will be able to be uh, to participate in the development of humanity the same way their ancestors did in the golden ages uh, of uh, islamic civilization who had been uh, quite active in shaping the civilization and not living on the sidelines as victims or uh, living away from development finally and in a world of globalization where humanity is facing different tribulations latest of which they covered the spread of COVID-19 pandemic which we are facing today Islam has to be Islam which is quite rich with unique spiritual resources it should correct the deviations of human development and its march towards the future Islam will not be a source of fear or worry or anxiety among people it will be more like a wonderful flower that moves forward to the development of humanity as a whole this is what all i have to say to you and i will be waiting for your comments or your questions thank you very much thank you mr mazuki and i would like to thank you once again for listening to me thank you thank you very much dr choi chenko for this uh, valuable uh, lecture uh, in which uh, you have undoubtedly uh, introduced uh, the efforts uh, by Sheikh Zayed Center of Arabic and Islamic Studies uh, to introduce to our uh, uh, friendly na na uh, people of China uh, the Arabic and Islamic uh, civilization and literature. And uh, we have seen how keen they have been on uh, finding on uh, finding out more about uh, Islam and the Arabic language. Since you are the director of this uh, uh, center, which is uh, more like an active link between uh, the uh, Chinese people and the Arab uh, people, uh, Muslims uh, globally, and you provide an opportunity for them to get to know more about uh, Arabic and Islamic uh, uh, literature and civilization. Maybe there is a self-evident question. Maybe the uh, uh, we can interpret uh, why uh, Chinese Muslims need to learn Arabic. They are keen on this because uh, the uh, Holy Quran was revealed in Arabic and they want to learn Arabic to be able to read the Holy Quran and learn 
the teachings of Islam. But what about the uh, the keenness of the rest of the Chinese people with the, with the different beliefs, religions, and ethnicities? How uh, far are they interested in the same thing? And how do you uh, value this or evaluate this? Uh, first, when I said uh, that uh, in China, we have more than 60 Chinese universities. Excuse me. Once again, if you can, uh, please uh, remove uh, the shared screen so the viewers can see you directly. Uh, yes, remove the uh, shared screen, the presentation, yes. No. Yes. Is it clear now? Yes. Isn't so. As for the 60 uh, Chinese universities that teach Arabic language, most uh, of students in those Chinese universities are non-Muslims. That is why we say that there is uh, a great deal of attention uh, among the Chinese people uh, to study, uh, to, regardless of their religious background, uh, they are very interested, and many young people are interested in studying the Arabic language. As far as I know, uh, Chinese uh, young people are interested in uh, studying the Arabic language for many reasons, including, including, for example, some of them have uh, their passion and their love for the Arabic uh, culture. Some of those young people visited Arabic uh, Arab countries, in, particularly uh, Dubai and the uh, and Abu Dhabi, and they love the Arabic language. Uh, and some of them, because uh, they have uh, their keenness on finding out more, they are curious to find out more about the Arab world. They believe that the Arab world is a charming world. It is associated in, with, in their memory to the 1001 nights. Of course, some of them study Arabic also because uh, they, they uh, want to seek uh, job opportunities and to find more jobs uh, because they know that uh, we have uh, uh, very good friendly relations between China and Arab countries in, at all levels. So being fluent in Arabic will help them to find jobs. Uh, and this is also a fact, yes. In addition to a number of other reasons, but these are the main reasons. Uh, so the, in, in answer to your question briefly, the, the attention to the Arabic language is not restricted to uh, Chinese Muslims only. No. Yes. There are many questions uh, that uh, we have received, and uh, uh, they, want to, they want you to tell us uh, in detail about the story that you have mentioned uh, about your presentation about the Muslim who met the Chinese emperor and how the Chinese emperor applied to him. Please, if you can explain it in detail, please. Yes, of course. Of course, uh, I'm a very open-minded uh, individual. I welcome all types of questions and I'm more than happy to answer. First, I will answer uh, to, the, to this uh, other question. Yes. The story is that uh, it, 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 it goes back to Yuan Dynasty in the 14th century AD, when the, the Swedish Orientalist Lausanne in the uh, 19th century, in his massive book, The History of the Mughals, he uh, mentioned a story uh, with Oblai Khan, the first ruler of Yuan Dynasty. And later on, uh, between two brackets, we say, there is, it was mentioned in this book that it was said that in the Holy Quran there is a verse that uh, uh, that uh, allows or permits for killing uh, non-Muslims. Some Christians mentioned this to the emperor, and uh, the emperor uh, called for bringing some prominent scholars, Muslim scholars, and asked the the, the leader do you have in your holy book and of course he's referring to the holy quran do you have something in your in the holy quran that refers to this meaning uh, uh, is this true and the muslim said yes and the emperor Imblai khan said do you believe that the holy quran in the book of almighty allah or of god uh, uh, he said yes undoubtedly we believe in that so the emperor said if uh, allah commands you to kill to kill uh, infidels or non-believers, why don't you obey him? He said, 
that that it's not time yet. Uh, there is the time is not suitable yet for killing them. And the emperor was angry and he said, but now it's high time for killing you. And he ordered his execution immediately. This is what happened. This is the uh, dialogue between uh, Oblai Khan, the emperor of Oblai Khan, and uh, that uh, Muslim scholar, which seems that he misunderstood Islam. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Choi, I visited China and uh, I met uh, a number of or many uh, Chinese Muslims. Maybe this is something unique uh, among the Muslim uh, community in China, is that Chinese Muslims have succeeded in striking a balance between their Chinese identity as Chinese citizens uh, and uh, uh, the fact that they are Muslims. In your understanding, what, how, uh, what's the secret of uh, the uh, success in the Chinese community uh, of Muslims uh, of how to strike the a balance between their identity as Chinese citizens and Muslims who have uh, Islamic religion and Islamic values? Uh, first, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hassan, for this uh, comment, which is uh, uh, a very good one. And it is uh, a very good observation, actually. Uh, it is a very important one to uh, uh, to undermine and to uh, uh, remove uh, some of the misconceptions or misinterpretation because of uh, some uh, uh, enemies of the west uh, enemies of the of china in the west uh, who uh, portray china as a country quelling uh, muslims but uh, your uh, uh, observation really uh, removes this misconception i believe i believe that uh, the uh, adaptation of uh, uh, Chinese Muslims with the Chinese with uh, Chinese circumstances. This is a phenomena that has had uh, that has had a relatively long history. I talked about that. Uh, uh, even at the 17th century, there was an attempt by uh, Muslim scholars in China, Chinese Muslim scholars, uh, uh, back then. So in reality, if we read uh, the writings uh, and I read a number of the works. Uh, which combine uh, writing and uh, 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 translation. Those Muslim scholars are very intelligent, actually. They expressed uh, their uh, Islamic beliefs and Islamic beliefs in by using uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, Confucius uh, uh, terms, Chinese Confucius terms, uh, and uh, by bringing this uh, 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 alignment uh, this gives an impression to non-muslims in china that islam to uh, a great extent resembles uh, uh, confucianism uh, in china and this is also uh, 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 true uh, despite the fact that there are some differences but the spiritual and key and primary spiritual values are shared values uh, that is why the arabic uh, culture and the chinese culture both of them belong to oriental cultures and uh, they have many common grounds uh, as oriental uh, cultures and civilizations. And uh, there are other aspects of uh, those activities and those efforts. Those uh, efforts also give to Muslims uh, the fact that uh, Islam does not contradict uh, the Chinese, uh, the, prefer the prevalent Chinese culture. It does not contradict uh, the Chinese environment. Uh, so you sh should be comfortable. You should be confident in yourselves uh, because you are part uh, of this culture. So these translations and these writings uh, have been uh, uh, warmly welcomed by uh, Chinese in uh, Chinese different Chinese circles and literary circles uh, and some of these books I mean the books that were written in Chinese about Islam by uh, uh, Muslim uh, uh, scholars and researchers some of those books are considered masterpieces of uh, Chinese heritage that is why we say that uh, Chinese Islamic concepts have become one of the pillars of the Chinese culture. That is why, in my answer to your question, this is a phenomenon that has had its historic roots, because Islam in China has its deep historic roots. And actually, Muslims in China today have been influenced by those uh, by the efforts of the predecessors and ancestors to align uh, chinese uh, uh, culture and uh, islamic culture uh, thank you yes uh, uh, i believe in my own modest opinion that uh, 
what distinguishes the Muslim community in China is that those Muslims were raised and grew up in China, and they come from uh, Chinese origins uh, that uh, go back to uh, several centuries back in China, and not the other, not, not unlike uh, the other Muslim communities where Muslims arrived as expats, uh, and uh, they have had this uh, maybe there is a misunderstanding of their own identity as Muslims and their citizenship uh, and the countries they travel from and the country they, the countries they immigrate from. One last question, Dr. Uh, Choi. Uh, what is your vision of uh, the future of the relationships, the cultural relationships between uh, China and the Islamic world? I believe uh, that the future uh, of the relationship between China and the Islamic world at all levels, uh, and not just uh, at the cultural level alone. It has a bright future. It will have a bright future uh, because uh, uh, of many elements uh, and causes. Historically speaking, as we know, historically, Islam and China and the Chinese culture have not had any negative uh, uh, heritage. There is no hatred. Uh, there is no both sides have no uh, hatred towards one another so we have pure uh, we have a pure past and this pure past uh, underscores and underpins uh, those uh, values and those uh, relationships secondly speaking about uh, the interests of both sides the development of uh, chinese arabic uh, islamic uh, relations will serve both sides interests china knows very well that the Arab world with the a, a population of around 300 million people and the Islamic world uh, which uh, uh, has more than 1 billion people is a massive uh, uh, human resources a massive uh, amount of human resources and uh, uh, they have uh, massive natural resources oil and gas and other resources so this is very important to uh, China and uh, in terms of the demographic uh, and the uh, uh, natural resources importance is this is very important to China and the same applies to China. China is the biggest China is the biggest country in the world and the richest uh, 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 actually the fastest growing economy globally. So uh, boosting bilateral relations uh, uh, serves the interests of both parties. In this context, I would like to refer to another point. We have a joint language. In the Arabic world, you have suffered in the past, and maybe you still suffer up till now, from the so-called Islamophobia, deforming your image in some Western communities. Unfortunately, this is happening. Now, China, we understand, and you already know that, uh, especially after the spread of COVID-19 in the West, uh, some, uh, uh, I'm not saying all Westerners, but some Westerners are de deforming the image of China and tarnishing the image of China and describing the Chinese people as uh, uh, barbaric uh, uh, people or savage people, and this is uh, uh, completely untrue. So we are also facing the same tarnishing of our image by some people in the west so this suffering or this mutual compassion in this regard also links both of us and makes us appreciate one another at the emotional and cultural level we are fully confident sir that everyone whether in china or the islamic world or globally god willing Everybody will work for the benefit of humanity, uh, despite the different uh, uh, religions and cultures. Uh, Dr. Shoi uh, Ching Ko, the director of uh, Sheikh Zayed Center uh, for Arabic and Islamic Studies uh, at Beijing uh, Foreign Studies University. Thank you very much uh, for this valuable lecture, and thank you very much uh, for the time you have dedicated to this webinar. And we hope to meet you again in upcoming occasions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. And I would like to thank, thank all the viewers and all the friends, uh, Arabs and Chinese friends and Muslim friends from all over the globe. Uh, I hope we will have another opportunity to meet you once again. Thank you very much. I wish you, uh, I hope 